please welcome to the stage Amy Liu, Danessa Myricks, Sarah Gibson Tuttle, and Sasha Wallace. Welcome, guys. Everyone's cool. We ate lunch. We had mimosas. The energy's up. Um, I am so excited to be sitting here with these phenomenal women uh, who probably need no introduction, but I am going to try my best to do so. Um, but before we dive in, my name is Sasha Wallace. I am the Senior Director of Customer Success here at Creator IQ, and I am so excited. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Um, I'm so excited to, to have you all here today, and I'm so excited for the content we're about to get into. So um, without further ado, I'd love to welcome Sarah Gibson Tuttle, who is the founder and CEO of Olive and June, um, who has really your hometown staple probably at this point. Um, uh, Olive and June was founded in 2013 and started in Beverly Hills. You started as a nail salon, but quickly grew into being a fully-fledged disruptor in the nail space. Um, and you're really known for democratizing nail care at home. So I know that personally we have a lot of fan favorites here at Creator IQ, but um, your innovative poppy handle and the press on instant nails are like one of the, some of the products that have gone viral and we love them here at Creator IQ. Danessa Myricks, who is... <laughs> So deserve we all the snaps. Um, founder and CEO of Danessa Myricks Beauty. Uh, Danessa Myricks Beauty was founded in 2015. You are a self-taught makeup artist and really created a brand that's known for your innovative formulas and your ability to pick, like blur the lines between artistry and everyday makeup. And I know there are probably tons of people here that know about your yummy skin line. Uh, the blur. blur <laughs> Blurry Bomb Powder, so I know my sister and I also personally love that. Um, so please welcome these two. And then last but certainly not least, Amy Liu, founder and CEO of Tower 28, founded in 2019 with a mission to create non-toxic beauty products for sensitive skin with a personal mission to really change the space. Um, and cult classics like the SOS uh, daily Rescue Spray that I know I personally use as well. Um, you all are phenomenal, and I am really lucky to be sitting next to you talking through women, how you guys redefine beauty in business. So one more round of applause for our guests. Thank you. Um, when we conceptualized this conversation, uh, it was really rooted in the story of your growth um, and success in each of your brands. Um, each of your brands have kind of reached that sweet spot that I would personally say where you've moved past like any initial virality of your products, any notoriety, and you're really experiencing a lot of scale and growth um, year over year. You all are in major retailers, you all are multinational, you all are award-winning products. Um, and in the kind of discussion of all of that, one thing that was kind of centric to your success was your community. All of you really have invested differently in your sense of community over the years. And I want to start off just by understanding a little bit about the long-term growth plan for your community. So how have you continued to invest in your communities as your brands have grown and seen success? And if you can add any insights into what strategies have been the most successful in keeping that sense of community alive. I can start left to right, whoever knows <laughs> first. Um, okay, I guess this is me. <laughs> um, when I think about community, like our brand is our community. We are a brand of the people for the people. There's no Danessa Marks beauty without our community. Mm. And so with that in mind, they are at the core of everything that we do. I like to say our community has a board seat. <laughs> they sit in our innovation department. They sit on our marketing team. It's who we create for. And so for us, you know, the engagement with the community has been different at different time points. Um, 
our brand was very much a bootstrap business, mm -hmm. you know. In the beginning, I was a one-woman show, like selling products out of my truck, you know, driving from state to state. Um, and so community looked a lot different then than it does now. But I think at the core, we've always listened, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think deep communication with our community has been the success of our brand. Um, and so that strategy will never change. We're here because of them. I think what we've been working on is finding deeper ways to engage with them and also to broaden the landscape of actually who they are. You know, our brand is for the people and our mantra is that we are beauty for all. And what does all mean? Well, we're every day finding new segments of all. Mm -hmm. The other day, um, I got a DM from somebody who was like, I just want you to know your new palette works for people who have physical disabilities, who have trouble using their hands. I tested it myself, and I could tell that story for you. And I'm like, wow, that wasn't even something that I was even thinking about. And so now this is this new com community that I want to become more connected with and understand better. So one of our strategies right now is going as wide as possible, and then utilizing the people that we partner in our community to go as deep as possible, um, and just figuring out exactly what that means. But on at every level, I am there talking to our people um, and listening and giving them opportunity to really participate in everything that we're doing. I love that. Yeah, I, w I would echo everything that you just said for at Olive and June, our mission has been beautiful nails for everyone since the beginning. And we always say beautiful nails for everyone means everyone. And so incredibly inclusive and thinking about how people are gonna use our products, what kind of products they want, that social listening, we answer every DM, we read every DM, we answer every email. I remember I was talking to a potential investor who I ended up turning down, and he said to me, well, at some point, it'll just scale to the place where you're just saying, like, hey, babe, we're good, like, thanks for your feedback. And I was like, it will never get to that point. We will never be at a scale where we're saying, hey, babe, thanks for your comment. It's always about hearing what people are saying and being super thoughtful about where they're coming from and what they want and what they want that's either different and we should innovate and create new products or to, to your point, you know, our poppy, which is our patented polish bottle handle, you use it really for your non-dominant hand because you're not a manicurist, so you're using both of your hands to paint your nails and not just your dominant hand. And we've had a lot of success with that generally and also with people that have physical disabilities. So it's just been like incredible for us. I think I really echo all of your sentiments about social listening. When you are created for a community and when you do it, and I think both of us, all three of us have done this from the beginning and not on purpose, not when community was a buzzword, but really because this is what comes deep in our soul and who we are as people, then it's very natural to listen, innovate, and then create. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, echoing everything that you've just said, and then additionally, I, even when you started, you had mentioned the difference between not just being a viral brand, but yeah. one that is able to sustain continued growth. And I think the biggest difference is, and I, I'm lucky enough to be friends with these two ladies, so I know this deeply, like we all really care about what we're doing and have a purpose. So the fact that there is a purpose-driven point to what we're doing is really what kind of gets us up in the morning. And I mm -hmm. think you can see that in the way that we work and then the way that we relate. <laughs> Hi. Uh, <I laughs> and the it. way that we relate with our customers. I mean, even for myself specifically, like I got into this because I've had eczema my entire adult life and I wanted to make products that were not only clean but safe for sensitive skin. And one of the things we did this year was we went to the National Eczema Association's Expo, which mm -hmm. is basically like 500 of the most chronic sufferers of eczema around the country and their caregivers. And meeting the community up close and hearing what they resonate with, what's important to them, and what they want really does help us inform not only the way we speak to things, but also the way that we will then formulate products. Because we hear things about like topical steroid withdrawal, and if you're going through that, what kind of things are you experiencing on your skin, and how does that show up? And on the other side of it, I personally find it incredibly inspiring because I hear people say things like, I've never been able to wear makeup until now, or I've never felt safe. Okay. And one of our, our, one of our mottos is we'd like to say that we create products, a safe space for sensitive skin. 
So I think community is at the heart of it, but to me it is everyone. It is our retailers, it is our, um, our employees, it is our consumers obviously, but it, and our content creators too. That's amazing, and I think you all just beautifully displayed how important it is to really embody those beliefs, like listening, being there, having a perspective from the top. So that clearly is, is attributable to your success. Um, I also want to talk through, just taking it maybe a step down, really uh, the role of micro-influencers in some of your strategies. Um, I'm going to direct this to Amy and you, Sarah. Just really how micro-influencers have played a role in the success of both Tower 28 and Olive in June and your growth. Um, how do you balance between using smaller creators, working with smaller creators, and working with more established creators while trying to build a community? Is there a balance? Yeah, I think it's like you have to do a little bit of everything, right? Like it's the, the classic funnel where I think you have to think about not only your consumer, but the micro-influencer, the, the macro-influencer. You have to think about, you know, out of home, pop-ups. Like it, there's no... Um, I think about this all the time, but like I think back in the, I've been in marketing for a long time and I can't remember what it, it used to be like you have to have seven points of interaction before you make a purchase. Mm -hmm. And if that was true back then, it must be like, I don't know, but a lot, lot more than that, right? <laughs> like you have to get like bombarded, it almost feels like before you're ready to take that dive. And so when I think about it, it's like you, the micro side of it is super important because like anything, um, and maybe this is like a, kind of a silly parallel, but like I, when I, even in work, right? So I've been in the industry for a long time. I will tell you the, the, the woman who was my, I was a VP of marketing. She was a coordinator on the Sephora side. And then she became, she just got promoted to senior director and she was the head of all of clean. Good for her. She was the one who actually like helped green light us and get us into Sephora. Mm -hmm. Like you should, everyone should be nice to each other because it's the right thing to do and because it's a small industry, by mm -hmm. the way. But also like we're all going somewhere and if we all invest in each other and we're able to kind of pick collaboration over competition, I think we all get there together and it's a lot more fun. But also like you, you just don't know. So it is really important to invest in micro content creators just like it is macro because we're, we're all in this together. Yeah, I think we, I echo everything again, because everyone is <laughs> very smart, because we didn't have mimosas at lunch. <laughs> and I, I, I would say that every interaction at Olive and June that we have with creators is organic and authentic. And we really look for people in the world who love nails. And we never want to be in a situation where we are trying to pay you to love nails. That's not interesting to us. It doesn't it doesn't generate the right kind of content. It just probably creates an unboxing video at the most, which doesn't do anything for anyone. Yeah. Everyone's seeing an unboxing video is like, thank you, Olive and June has beautiful packaging, and we move on. And that person who was watching it goes and gets their nails done in a salon. So that's not interesting. What's interesting is working with people that deeply love nails and deeply love DIY nails. And so an example, you know, we, I would say we mostly work with micro-influencers because we feel that the impact, the virality, that impact, that influence is so much greater than when you work with a macro. But, for example, we saw that Colleen Hoover was using our nail polish that she had bought at Target, and that sparked a huge collaboration that we did with Colleen that was online, it was digital on our site, but also across all of her socials, across BookTok, and also in Target and Caps Nationwide. That's a great example of a macro influencer collaboration that was not paid and was mm -hmm. simply born out of someone loving our product. Yeah. And so we always look to people that either love nails or love our product specifically, and then we naturally organically build that relationship. I love that. I think having going with your fans and the people who really believe in what you do, I think is also a huge part of your long-term success as well. Because you guys also, there's a question coming later about this, but you, you guys keep coming up with great things. Um, as, I'm gonna point- I think it's really obvious when you pay someone and they're like, yeah. this nail polish is great. And then they never talk about <laughs> it. I mean, we don't do that, but I see that on the internet and no one in this audience or in the world wants to buy that polish. Yeah, I mean, we were talking with Summer Fridays earlier this morning, and they also said, you know, she looks into her platform at Creator IQ and can see who actually doesn't really use the product but wants to post about it. So authenticity remains to be king. Uh, Danessa, I want to just 
talk to you about content. Um, speaking of our, our discussions earlier today, a lot of you might have been to our product lab and seen that our vision for Creator IQ is to really emphasize the purpose of content and really putting it on a platform to help brands make better decisions, working with the right creators and partners. I'm just curious for you, just story time, just what has been some of the most impactful, maybe creator-driven initiatives or projects that you've gotten to do so far? She's <laughs> Big like questions, maybe. Stage <laughs> mom, <laughs> SGT. I love you. <laughs> um, uh, so I would say, when I think about creator partnerships, it always starts from a very authentic place. Mm -hmm. And we've never really leaned into a relationship that wasn't a relationship because transactions aren't relationships, right? And so what I've always wanted to do is to reward the people who've, who've told our story and told our story really well. Um, and so we've never really had a strategy around paid partnerships. It's never was a strategy. Our strategy was more around gifting and sharing and getting our product into as many hands as possible. But I will say that the biggest moments that the brand has had has been through micro-influencers who had their own unique experience with our brand just simply because they loved it mm. um, through the innovation. A perfect example of that would be with blurring bomb powder. So blurring bomb powder, like literally, if somebody says, what does it do? Like I can talk for three hours, right? <laughs> it's so many things. And me, as a creator, I wanted to tell all those stories, right? But the real story is a story that resonates with your community. And so there was a, a girl who had just moved to New York and she was sad. She didn't have any friends here. She loved beauty. She went to Sephora to make herself happy, and she saw bomb powder. She got home, she opened her Sephora bag on TikTok and experienced it the for, for the first time, took her fingers, put it in bomb powder, and went like this and said, oh, look, did you see that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Literally, those were the words heard around the planet. And those, did you see that, literally transformed our business. Wow. Like, our business has never been the same since that moment, and it was completely organic. She organically loved the brand. I invited her to my birthday party because oh, I wanted to thank her um, oh, for... I like, love that. I wanted her to know what she did. She didn't even know yeah. what she did, but she, she, I knew she had no friends here. I was like, well, meet mine. And I invited <laughs> her to my birthday party, and we formed a real relationship, right? And so... That, re that relationship remains, but it's super authentic, right? And I, I wanted to continue that relationship. And you know, when people see her using other products from our brand, whether it was um, a, paid, um, uh, a paid situation or not, they believe it because it started off yeah. that way, right? And I think that's how I continue to think about what these relationships should look like. I would say micro-influencers has really been the, the wind beneath our wings. You know, a lot of people, they'll say, how did you get that partnership with Monet? Mm. Or, you know, how did you get that, that partnership with Jackie? I'm like, what partnership? Like, what we have is deep love for mm. each other. What we have is we connected on some level about something. I met Monet one time in my life, and what she shared with me was an experience that she had with one of my products that made her feel confident about using Sparkle. So I'm sure she gets paid gazillions of dollars um, that I can't afford, but you know, and she's not looking for it. She's looking to just talk about something that she really loves. And I think that's really the, the, the bottom line of everything that we're doing is to find the people who deeply love the things mm -hmm. that we create and to really lean into it. And to have those help, those people will help guide you to other people like them who want to be able to tell that story. And as a brand, you can decide how you can participate in that. Is it sending a product? Is it just doing a Zoom with a bunch of people who said they love you and just talking for 30 minutes? Because you know what? Sometimes that means more than money to, to people. Just really being able to deepen the relationship with a brand that they love and a product that has changed their life in some way. And so that's how I look at just the interactions that I have with the community. I just think of them as, you know, Friends, well, okay. <laughs> the yeah. part of our family, and I, think, and, I, and I think to your point, the more real and authentic it is, it's more fun for us, yes. and it's more fun for them, and the consumer can feel that. I think. Oh, 100%. I love the humanity in it. 
it's awesome. I think when it comes from all of us being the consumer first for our mm -hmm. own products, it's very authentic to then want to share and talk and build this community naturally versus we went to business school and there's like a white yeah. space and that's why we created what we created. None, none of us I did I mean, I that. did go to yes. business school, but that's okay. <laughs> but you did not, did you create your eczema in the white space <laughs> board? I had eczema during business school. <laughs> but I think, I mean, I just think the authenticity shows through. And then your team, like speaking of our teams, like our teams feel it from us. Mm -hmm. You know, I answered every DM from the Olive and June account before we hired a team. And so now they answer every DM and there are no hey babes because we don't do that. We really talk to people because hey we babes. love them. Hey babe. <laughs> hey, hey babe. I, that'll haunt me the rest of my life. We should get t-shirts. Yeah. Hey babe. No <laughs> hey babes. No hey babes. <laughs> this is, so as founders and CEOs, I'm sure you're very comfortable with the word adapt and probably, this is my shift dance, doing a lot of shifting, <laughs> moving and shaking. Um, and one of the big shifts within, as all of us know, within our space is social platforms and adapting to how we look at content and how we use the different social platforms that are um, popping up. And I actually pulled some quick stats um, because, you know, six years ago, oh. <laughs> Six years ago, you know, TikTok, I don't know if it was even top of mind for you guys as you were building out your influencer strategy or four years ago even. Um, but year over year in EMV, you guys have grown significantly. So Tower 28 has had over 325% year over year growth on TikTok. Oh yeah, we're good. Guys, we want to snap. Let's snap. Vanessa Myricks has seen over 292% year over year growth. And Olive in June has seen 496% year over year. And that's an average of 371%. So my question is, um, as you guys are thinking about your brands and your strategies, you know, how are you thinking about how each platform plays into your creator strategy now? Is, are you thinking about conceptualizing per platform? Are you looking at it differently? and thinking about how you need to employ each of the platforms in your strategies? Oh, to anyone. <laughs> I, 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 all this, we were just literally, this morning my team was like kind of slacking back and forth about this because somebody had pulled a, a, a statistic from um, Forbes that said something about how now Gen Z is actually seeing, there's an increase of people, um, Gen Z, actually paying attention to Instagram. And I was like, is that true? Or is that really actually happening? I don't know if that's true or not. And so then we had people chiming in that were more Gen Z that was like, no, it's all about TikTok and <laughs> Snapchat's like going away. And I, listen, I don't really know, but I think the one thing we can all agree on is you kind of have to be everywhere, right? So you do have to TikTok, no one's, TikTok's not going away unless someone makes it go away. And Instagram is obviously amazing for all the reasons it is, but I think they have different purposes. Mm -hmm. Like I think, like Instagram, you look at Instagram, and I still believe if people don't know who you are, they are taking a look at your feed really quickly and trying to get a sense of your aesthetics and who you are. And I think what you put on TikTok might be a little bit different and the algorithms are now so smart that it knows if you're using the same content in both places and, yeah. and it doesn't want that. And mm -hmm. so, and then there's YouTube shorts. So it's like they're, there is not a one-size-fits-all strategy to it, but I think the only thing that has to be consistent is you have to be the real version of you, but maybe you're like slightly different. Like we were, I don't know if Vivian was in my team, she's out here somewhere, but we were talking about it the other day and she was saying, she's like, I think Instagram is like the older big sister and that's who's speaking. She's like the one who knows everything and that is gonna tell you and then TikTok is where we get to be like the younger sister who also thinks she knows what's going on too, but maybe she's a little sassier. So it That's can both sister. be the same, it's the same story. It can't be a different story, but it can sound slightly different. I think um, for me, it's really meeting people where they are. So our brand was born on Instagram, right? It's, it's a place where people first saw us like globally and it's where I do all my tutorials and all those things and it's it's my little comfy spot. It's where I'm comfortable. Um, but that's not where my audience is and I don't really think that I can tell the full story of my audience on that one platform. So the way I think about it is like 
where is our community? And who can tell a rich story in those spaces? Um, just recently, I had an interaction with a nine-year-old at Sephora. She did not look like me. She had blonde hair and big blue eyes, and she was dragging her mother over to me, and her mother was like, I don't even know what's happening here. And I was like, it's okay. And she, the, she held me so tight. Aww. Like, I literally just was like bawling, crying, because she was Aww. holding me so tight. And she, was, she just kept saying, I love you. I love you so much. I love you. And in my mind, it's like, how does this nine-year-old, how, how does she know me? Yeah. How yeah. did she find me? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> what does she love, right? And, and, and beyond that, she came back the next day to another session. And her mom was like, I know you met her yesterday. Can you give her a second? I was like, yeah, of course. And She's like, I just wanted to make sure you were okay before I did anything else. And I'm, I'm like baffled. How does she know who I am? And I'm also thinking, who's talking to her? I'm not. I'm a 54-year-old, 54-year-old black woman. <laughs> Where did, how does she know? Although I would Somebody. argue, if anyone has ever received a hug from Danessa, it's a good hug. You, you get it. I <laughs> but I'm like, who's... I in line, too. I love you. But I'm just like, who's... Who's talking to her, right? Is she on Instagram? Is she somebody on TikTok? Did she watch a YouTube video? How did she find me? So for me, it's about I need to, A, stop being so shy and introverted and find myself in other places. But also what's more important is for me to find members of my community who can speak to her, yeah. mm. right? And, and that's, I have to be everywhere in order to do that, and I have to be engaging people beyond my social team and me. It's the community that has to be telling that story. She's watching another nine-year-old. She's bringing her into her bathroom, right? And so this is why I think it's really important for, for me as a founder and our brand to be doing the job that we said we're here to do. We're here for everyone at all times, then that means that we need to meet them where they are. So every platform is important. The only thing I would add to that incredible story, other than I would also like a hug, yeah. is, yeah. is um, you know, we look at all of our platforms differently, and we let the community tell us what's resonating to them. So on TikTok, there's a lot of hacks, and how do you get a salon manicure dupe? How do you, Quick Dry does incredibly well on TikTok because people are looking for, again, that like quick manicure. And then Instagram and YouTube, there's just different content. Instagram is a lot of nail art. YouTube is a lot of more, uh, you know, long form, which is like three minutes these days is long form, which is, <laughs> I'm so old that that's what long form is. But, you know, I, I'm like 30 minutes is long form. Not anymore, everyone. So, you know, I think we really let the audience tell us they vote. You know, they're voting. They're voting with comments. They're voting with shares. They're voting with likes. You can tell what they want. And so we really tailor our our content and as Amy said you know there's always a through line but we tailor our content to really um, hit that audience and then we test things too to make sure that, that we know we're you know, always keeping up with what's new but the audiences are incredibly different to your point and they tell you what they want. Yeah. Love that. I, we are sadly wrapping up. We could probably talk forever. <laughs> I know. 25 minutes goes by way too fast, but I, I guess I want to close with just, I guess, your insights for the future. I'd love for each of you maybe to um, tell us some things that you're excited about for your brands going into 2025 and beyond, um, and what you're looking forward to. You're going first. Yes, I'm going first. <laughs> I'm like, ooh. Uh, okay, so what I'm excited for, I mean, honestly, we just showed, we did, just did Market Week, is, which is when you meet with Sephora for us, and you show them your pipeline for next year, and I have to tell you guys, our pipeline's good. It looks good. Um, so there's there's more product, but there's also just um, more amazing, fun. Honestly, shout out to the team. They're doing a great job, and it's it's just really exciting. When I think for all of us, when you put something out into the world, and people receive it, and it resonates, and it works for them. Like I was just in the lobby outside, and someone came up to me and was like, oh my God, your SOS spray has saved my skin and like told me her whole story. And she's like, you probably get this all the time. And I do, but I have to tell you, it never gets old because I went into this with the intention of hoping that I could help other people help myself. And I think the fact that that is possible is pretty amazing. So. Love it. I'm excited. Yep. <laughs> I'm gonna double down on what she said. <laughs> And I think the cool thing about what the future looks like for us is that we really, everything that's coming up is really out of the requests of our audience. 
There's nothing that I'm making that has not been inspired by our community. And I'm excited to show them, show it to them in a way that they didn't even imagine. So um, when it comes to innovation, that's where we thrive. And so I'm super excited about that. But I'm also excited about how each one of these uh, platforms are creating new opportunities for us to engage in ways that I feel more confident in. And um, like the live, live selling, like, yeah. I, I'm not, I can't do 30 second sales pitch, that's not me. But I can, I can talk to you for an hour and answer all your questions <laughs> and you know, that, that feels good for me. And um, I heard earlier today about YouTube and YouTube selling, I didn't even know yeah. that was a thing, right? And so um, I'm happy that as a team, we've already been working on ways that we wanna like deepen our communication throughout all of these di digital spaces. And now today I've learned that, you know, we can do even more, we can monetize it, I can be more present with the community in different ways. So 2025 is gonna look really, really good. Yeah, I'm really excited. Love this. I mean, I'm very excited as well. Uh, we have, <laughs> we do one huge innovation launch a year and it's in two weeks. Ooh, and oh. we are very excited. We'll launch it on our website and then it'll be in retail at the end of the year, early next year. So we're very excited about that. and. We have polish, we have press-ons, but a little bit of a hint, now that we've taught millions of people to paint their nails, this is the next iteration of what that would look like at home. Ooh. So we're very excited. Ooh. Ooh. Mysterious, yeah. yeah. Well, ladies. I know, one. <laughs> <laughs> one, to be clear, one innovation launch a year, oh, okay. we launch things almost every month. So okay, okay, okay. product-wise, we launch all the time. But innovation, we do one big innovation a year. Well, I am excited. I'm excited for everything that you're sharing with us and looking forward to the future. Thank you all for joining us today in conversation. And please give me one more round of applause. Thank you.